With the permission of all the respected faculty members of Presidency University in Kolkata and with the valuable presence of our speaker, I would like to ask for the permission to initiate the fifth webinar session of Geochron Chapter 2. Before I begin, kindly take note of a few important things. We request you to obey by the following parameters during the lecture in order to maintain a smooth session. Please keep your cameras and microphones off during the session as this is very important to maintain a smooth lecture series. Screen sharing and other such malpractices are prohibited and the session should not be recorded in any way by any of the attendees. These rules are necessary to be followed in order to maintain the decorum of our session. We shall be compelled to remove the participants who do not abide by these protocols. A very good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everybody. I am Rita Nuka, member of Geological Institute, Presidency University, Kolkata, and I extend my heartiest welcome to all our participants and guests hailing from different parts of the world to today's lecture session of Geochron 2020. I shall be your host for the day and I take immense pleasure to announce that this is going to be the ninth webinar session of the whole Geochron series and the fifth of Geochron chapter two. I will once again request everyone to please keep their cameras and microphones off. A question answer form has already been sent to all the participants via mail and telegram groups along with the shared webinar link. In case if you haven't found it yet in your inbox, kindly check your spam folders. If you are viewing us on YouTube, then don't forget to check the description box to find the attached link for the Q&A form. Today, we are really fortunate to have with us Dr. Probir Dashguptu, Associate Professor and Head, Department of Geology, Durgapur Government College, India. He is an alumnus of erstwhile Presidency College and received his PhD from Calcutta University under self-guidance. He is a renowned sedimentologist and he started working on the reconstruction of tectonic sedimentary history of Gondwana basins in Peninsula India initially and later extended his field to the lesser and sub Himalayan sedimentary successions. Apart from this, he also addressed some fundamental issues of sedimentology through laboratory simulations, which include grain flow dynamics and development of inverse grading, mechanisms of formation of slump folds of varied geometry and fluid escape structure. He also resolved the controversies related to deposition of carbonate aeolinites of Shodastro through his laboratory simulations and also designed an inclinometer for precise acquisition of paleocurrent data and techniques of paleoflow from trough cross stratification. We are highly honored to have him with us to deliver a talk on the topic mass flow dynamics and appraisal. We are sure that this lecture session will be highly enriching and one of its kind. I would now request our very own beloved Professor Joydeep Mukhopadhyay, Professor in the Department of Geology, President's University, to give a bit more introduction about our speaker and to welcome him to the virtual dais. Sir. Thank you, Ritonika. I think I am audible. Good morning, everyone. Sir, you are the best. Yeah, good morning everybody and welcome. Uh, I welcome you all to the Department of Geology and to this uh, webinar hosted by the Geological Institute. It's my immense pleasure this morning to introduce Professor Prabhupada Dasgupta as a speaker uh, for this morning. Professor Dasgupta started his early career as a geologist in ONGC, but his keen interest in academics was the prime guiding factor when he joined Durgapur Government College as a lecturer in geology in the middle of 1980s. He served the erstwhile Presidency College and Presidency University from 1996 to 2014 as a member of the Faculty of Geology Department and in administrative position in the Presidency University subsequently. He became the head of the Department of Geology at Durgapur Government College and he is also now the chairman of the Boards of Studies in Geology of the Kaji Nojrul University. Professor Dasgupta is a researcher extraordinary. 
He independently started experimental sedimentology laboratory at the Presidency College. With his strong footing in fundamental science and his engineering innovation, he developed a miniature flume lab at Presidency, mainly experimenting with mass flows, in particular the grain flow and some of the soft sediment deformation features that we every day observe in rocks. And he modeled this, all these sedimentary phenomena and sedimentary structures in his flume lab with great precision. And he published results of his experiments in top ranking journals such as Sedimentology, Earth Science Reviews, and Journal of Structural, Structural Geology. He has successfully applied the experimental findings in resolving phases implications in sedimentary successions of the Gondwana deposits in parts of Eastern India and also in other parts of the Gondwana basins in India. His research interest is internationally acclaimed. Professor Dasgupta is also collaborating with researchers from other nations. He successfully extended his expertise to the Department of Geology, University of Manar, Tunisia, in deciphering the Barremian paleogeography of the Central North America, no, it's North Af Africa. Recently, a team led by him and his PhD scholar has resolved a long standing controversy regarding the depositional significance of the blindy diametites of Lesser Himalaya. His recent analysis on plausible relation between the Gondwana Basin formation and Gondwana land fragmentation definitely has a very deep rooted implication and opened up a new frontier of research in Gondwana geology and supercontinent fragmentation and assembly. As already mentioned by Ritonuka, Professor Dasgupta has an impeccable academic career. He has received Dr. J. Coggin Brown Memorial Cash Award from the Mining, Geological and Metallurgical Institute of India for obtaining the highest marks in BSc examinations of geology honors from Calcutta University. He has also received the Jubilee Postgraduate Merit Prize for securing first rank in the first class in BSc honors examination of geology in the year 1980. He received subsequently the university gold medal from Calcutta University for securing first rank in the first class for MSc geology examination in 1982. Above all, PDG sir, as he is known with deep respect and admiration and regards to his students and his colleagues as a teaching career for nearly four decades. In recognition of his excellence in teaching, he received the UGC CEC Award of Subject Expert of Best Educational Program in Earth Sciences in 2006 from the University Grants Commission and Consortium of Educational Communication. Let me invite Professor Dasgupta this morning to deliver his talk and his finding on mass flow dynamics, and that would definitely would be very important for all of us. Thank you very much, and let me welcome Professor Dasgupta. <coughs> Thank you. Very good morning to everybody, and good afternoon and good evening to those from other half of the globe. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are. Yes, yes, yes. yes sir. Thank you. I am thankful to uh, the Geological Institute for giving me this opportunity to share my views with you. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, sir, it's visible. Okay, thank you. So today, sir, I'm going... Sorry to interrupt you. Can you minimize the small screen at the right? Oh, button? yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, today, I am going to uh, discuss a few points on mass flow dynamics. Actually, I have designed this talk, keeping in mind the students as a target audience. So, I may spend some time on very basic issues like definition, etc. So, learned members of the audience, please bear with us. Now, mass flow. What is mass flow? The natural sedimentation can be broadly of two types, primary sedimentation and resedimentation. Primary sedimentation means uh, 
the sedimentation uh, that takes place uh, from surface processes. And resedimentation involves instability of pre existing sediments, its remobilization, and again sedimentation. And the flow types which are involved in the process of resedimentation, they are broadly classified under the head mass flow. Some other terms are also used, high density flow, some people call it uh, sediment gravity flow. Uh, now, uh, before going to the main topic, uh, I would like to mention a few points, particularly for the students of undergraduate classes. First of all, why should we study mass flow? In any basin field succession, normally we get at the base a mass flow deposit. That means the Basin opening is often marked by a resedimentation process. And when these mass flow deposits are found within the basin field succession at different levels, this normally indicates a major tectonic or climatic events. And these are episodic events, so they are essentially time parallel, and that's why they are very important in uh, stratigraphic correlation. And being the product of episodic event, the deposits are potential site for hydrocarbon entrapment in deep marine setting. Now, uh, today's discussion is on dynamics. So why should we uh, discuss dynamics or rather flow dynamics? Actually, with a geologist, we deal with the end product of the whole process, that is the rock record. Now, we should have a very clear idea about the process-product relationship. Otherwise, we cannot decipher the tectonosedimentary history of the basin field succession from this information. Now, this, as I mentioned, the resedimentation process involves initial instability of pre-existing sediments. Now, this instability may be due to two reasons. One is over of the parent deposit, and the other is liquidization of the parent deposit. Now, over it is actually defined by the Mokulam yield criterion. When the surface of the sedimentary heap tends to become steeper than the angle of initial yield, instability sets in and the whole mass may be removed. Now, actually, what happens uh, when they uh, start flowing uh, avalanche down, normally they uh, become stable uh, when the surface angle reaches an uh, angle of repose. But when the over takes place at any slope break, say shelf slope margin, etc., there there is no scope of uh, restabilization and they uh, flow down the steep slope. And liquidization is uh, due to enhancement of pore fluid pressure. It uh, may be seismogenic or storm wave induced. Now, this liquidization is actually a change in state of mass of sediments from quasi solid to liquid like due to sudden increase in pore fluid pressure. And this is broadly of two types, liquefaction and fluidization. And in liquefaction, after the initial dispersion, particles settle down against the upwelling fluid. But when the intensity of shock is very high, then fluidization takes place. The dispersed particles are carried by the upwelling fluid. Now, these flow types were first organized by Milton and Hampton in 1973. They classified natural flows broadly into two categories, fluid gravity flow and sediment gravity flow. In fluid gravity flow, the fluid is moved by the gravity and drives the sediment along. And in sediment gravity flow, the sediment is moved by the gravity and the sediment motion moves the interstitial fluid. Now, this particular definition does not fit well for all types of mass flow. Say, for example, 
in drain flow, there is no role of any fluid. Uh, and the most common type that is stability current. Their particles are the minor constituent of the flowing mass. Fluid is the main constituent. So their fluid plays the major role. In our course of discussion, we'll see uh, those parts. Now, however, uh, they identified four types of uh, flows, uh, turbidity current, fluidized flow, Davis flow, and grain flow. And they uh, classified them with reference to dominant sediment support mechanism. Now, uh, Laue slightly modified this classification. And instead of only fluidized flow, he uh, included liquefied flow. Debris flow was renamed as cohesive debris flow, but I don't know why he included mud flow here because mud flow is not a debris flow. However, I will come to that point later. Now, what is sediment support mechanism? When it is a multiphase flow, that means more than two components are involved there. Say, for example, turbidity current. It's a flow of sediment fluid mixture. Now, for maintenance of this flow, its character, its rheology, the particles have to be in the flowing mass. If the particles tend to settle down under the action of gravity, then obviously the flow character changes and it will be no longer uh, turbidity current. So some mechanism is required for maintenance of the particles in suspension within the flowing mass, and that is called sediment support mechanism. But in case of grain flow, we'll uh, discuss later, the sediment support mechanism is not required at all. Okay. However, uh, we'll come to the, uh, those points later. Now, out of these flow types, the liquidized flows, that means the fluidized flow and liquefied flow, these two types of flow cannot be possible in sedimentary condition. It was specifically pointed out by Allen that once, uh, say, uh, after initial liquidization, when the sediment starts moving, the port fluid pressure tends to dissipate. And in uh, common sedimentary flows, discontinuation of the triggering mechanism, because for enhancement of port fluid pressure, some triggering mechanism must be there. And uh, due to discontinuation of this uh, triggering mechanism, uh, the maintenance of hard, uh, high uh, fluid pressure uh, cannot be possible. And that's why sustained liquidized flow is not possible in sedimentary condition. But in case of pyroclastic flow, it is possible. When uh, it is mainly uh, due to some self-liquidization mechanism, uh, due to continuous release of gases in a subaerial condition or uh, steam generated from engulfed water is subaqueous condition. Those can maintain this pressure. So in sedimentary condition, we don't expect liquidized uh, flow. And that's why uh, we can exclude uh, these two types uh, from our discussion. So we will mainly discuss on the end members, stability current, debris flow, and grain flow, and some other intermediate flow types. Now, Stability current, uh, I think uh, all of you know about this current. This is perhaps the most common type and most widely studied both in laboratory and in the recent environment. And so far as the dynamics of turbidity current is concerned, we have come to know about the details from a series of publication from Middleton. Uh, during 1966 and 67, these papers were published in uh, Canadian Journal of Art Science. This is an ideal turbidity current. This is called head, and this is a body. This is neck. Now, material is supplied from body through neck to the head, and deposition takes place from this head. Now, what is turbidity current? It is a variety of density current 
that is flow of one fluid within another caused by the density contrast between them. And the density contrast is caused by high concentration of sediment within the flowing mass. And the sediments remain in dispersed state within the turbidity current due to fluid turbulence. Now, one point is very important here. That is the density contrast. And proper understanding of this particular density factor is important to understand the dynamics of turbidity current. Otherwise, a lot of confusions are there uh, in uh, literature. So <clears throat> let's uh, see what is actually this particular parameter. Now, density factor, uh, this uh, based on relative density of the flowing fluid and the ambient fluid, three terms were introduced by Bates in his famous paper on rational theory of delta formation. But uh, the definition uh, by Bates is were slightly confusing. That's why a lot of misunderstanding is there. Actually, in uh, fluid dynamics, we consider uh, this uh, uh, homopicnal, hypopicnal, and hyperpicnal conditions. In homopicnal condition, the densities of the fluid component of the flow and the ambient fluid, these two are same. In hypopicnal condition, the ambient fluid is denser and the reverse situation is hyperpicnal. Actually, in nature, uh, hyperpicnal condition is not very common because uh, we don't have any evidence of. Uh, any high, uh, hypersaline fluid is entering into a freshwater body. But in case of uh, uh, polar region, that uh, bottom current due to uh, what we call thermohaline uh, flow, uh, in that case, uh, that uh, fluid, flowing fluid is denser, and that is the only hyperpicnal condition prevailing on our surface. Now, <laughs> this. Uh, as I mentioned, this density uh, factor has been uh, considered by different authors in different way. This is one example, just uh, extension of Bates view. Uh, Davies uh, further expanded the uh, Bates classification of uh, different types of delta. There, he demonstrated that when a freshwater uh, riverine flow is entering into a freshwater lake. And uh, this riverine flow is charged with uh, sediment. So this sediment water mixture will flow into the freshwater as a turbidity current. And that's why their mouth bursts are concave uh, upstream. But when this flow is entering into a saline water body, that means uh, men in condition, the sediment water mixture will go into suspension as bivalent plume and sedimentation takes place from uh, this mass as suspension fallout, producing this type of mouthburst. But uh, some other uh, definitions uh, have also been put forward by different workers. The extreme Example is proposition of hyperpicnal turbidity current by Mulder and Sivisky in 1995. Now, according to them, the riverine material is transported directly to the marine uh, environment, to the continental shelf and slope, or to the abyss, to that extreme distance. Uh, but uh, here, they designated this as hyperpicnal because of presence of suspended material within the freshwater mass. But, uh, and uh, they use this term to distinguish it from the conventional turbidity current. But the problem is that according to their definition, if sediment, uh, uh, presence of sediment uh, is defining the hyperpicnal condition of the flowing mass, then the normal turbidity current is also hyperpicnal. In such condition, how can they distinguish this type from uh, the conventional turbidity current by this nomenclature? That is slightly confusing. However, there are a lot of limitations uh, 
in this uh, concept and shomugam put forward a series of uh, papers uh, pointing out different limitations and uh, all these were summarized in a recent paper by shomugam in 2018 now <clears throat> what is the actual situation of this density factor and uh, through laboratory experiment it has been established that this relation is defined by a, a unitless parameter that is called gamma and gamma is expressed by this where this rho a is the density of the ambient fluid rho i according to the density of the interstitial fluid that means the density of the uh, fluid uh, component of the flowing mass and uh, rho p is the density average density of the particulate material and c is the grain concentration so uh, for undergraduate students i would like to mention that grain concentration means uh, volume of grain per unit bulk volume of the flowing mass now it has been experimentally proved that when gamma is equal to zero the flow is ground hugging current that means our conventional turbidity current so gamma is equal to zero means these two uh, densities are same so that is homopicnal condition when gamma is greater than one then uh, this uh, flow as soon as it is discharged uh, it will uh, move as a free surface flow and when gamma lies between 0 and 1 that part is very interesting the current is dense initially but has a potential to reverse in buoyancy and loft and in that case gamma represents the proportion of the initially suspended material relative to the total now let's see what is the actual situation to this uh, demonstration here uh, we have taken saline water in a jar and salinity is same as the average salinity of seawater. That means uh, uh, your 3.5 grams per 100 cc. Okay. And some amount of sediment has been uh, kept under this cup and when we release this cup, the situation is uh, equivalent to over or uh, liquid, uh, liquidization within the basin. Now, what happens? Let's see. This sediment is flowing down as turbidity current smoothly, as ground hugging turbidity current. But when we release a mixture of fresh water and sediment into this saline water body then what happens let's see initially it will proceed as this. Then, now, after deceleration and the whole material is going into suspension now the deposition will take place as suspension fallout so this cannot proceed further as a turbidity current and this loft up distance is defined by the initial momentum of the plunging flow now the question is that what are the reasons behind this buoyancy reversal first of all we should keep in mind that the plunging flow is an inhomogeneous mixture of water and sediment it is not a solution and uh, actually when we add sediment in a mixture uh, in most cases i have observed that people only consider the mass of sediment they are adding but since it is a mixture we are adding the volume also so obviously we should be very careful when we will estimate the average density of this flowing mass and since this is a mixture and water is the major constituent uh, component of this mixture so practically water is carrying the sediments so when this fresh water mixture is entering into uh, sea it readily decelerates and why deceleration 
one reason is definitely the density contrast the other reasons are the opposing forces like wave action marine current etc and due to this deceleration the carrying capacity of this flowing mass declines and the force of fraction gets deposited the finest material that is the clay the proportion of clay due to turbulence which comes to the vessel part of this flowing mass on reaching the interface when these particles come in direct contact with the saline water they readily coagulate and gets deposited and this phenomenon is explained by dlvo theory uh, named after the proponents of this theory uh, this explains how uh, this colloidal particles uh, when uh, comes in contact with some electrolyte uh, gets coagulated and deposited so by this way it declines and loft up phenomenon takes place now this is a uh, google earth view of sundarbans delta here you see this uh, rivers are discharging material into bay of bengal but these are proceeding as buoyant plume not as turbidity current here you can see the shade of these plumes also so turbidity current is expected to develop and sustain under homopicnal condition and that's why we get turbidites in marine and continental lacustrine condition only in rock record now there is one case that that is the case of jockel haps uh, where the continental flow can proceed into sea as turbidity current what is jockel haps this is an icelandic term in iceland you know that uh, the mid oceanic ridge lift system is exposed on the earth surface and during volcanism huge amount of melt water is released and it carries huge amount of uh, sediments uh, just as flash flood it enters into the sea now uh, first of all it has got a very high momentum so it can easily penetrate and second uh, point is that uh, this is melt water so its density is slightly higher than our conventional fresh water and it normally extends up to the deeper shelf and in uh, peri glacial environment particularly in polar region we get uh, deposits uh, like fan delta in deeper shelf caused due to jocularps now this is a typical turbidite succession this is a deep sea fan succession from lesser himalaya and in turbidite we normally expect some features depositional features the most common one we expect that is normal head as i mentioned earlier that deposition takes place from the head now uh, during this process the coarser materials uh, comes to the uh, near the base and the finer fraction is taken back to the main body of the flow so first the coarser material is deposited then the finer material Uh, comes about the coastal material by this way the normal grading uh, develops now you see uh, we may get this feature in different scales this is uh, about uh, 20 cm thick uh, uh, containing some gravel fraction also uh, this is a uh, few uh, centimeters only 4 to 5 cm thick and this one is a photomicrograph this is 500 micrometer so this is the beauty of this flow dynamics these are all scale independent another type of grading we may get in turbidites uh, but uh, it is not so common as normal grading this is called coarse tail inverse grading there are two types of grading we know one is coarse tail where the only coarser fraction is uh, graded and the other is distribution type where the whole uh, fraction is uh, whole population is graded now this coarse tail uh, inverse grading uh, this mechanism was explained by hand in 1997 uh, now uh, what happens uh, if the coarsest fraction uh, 
lags behind the head of the flow, then uh, relatively fine material gets deposited first, then the coarser uh, fraction comes to this uh, position and gets deposited. At the finest material, it is in suspension, it is evenly distributed. So we get coarse inverse grade. But this grading may not be readily identifiable in some of the turbidite succession, as I have shown the deep sea fan uh, succession, where material is so fine grained that if grading is there, it's very difficult to identify in the field. Only we can uh, see those from uh, in thin section. But some features are very common in any turbidite. And out of those, first comes the load cast. It is uh, mainly due to rapid deposition of sand above uh, clay. Actually, in a common turbidite, that is a, a alternation of clay and sand. Now, this uh, load cast may be of regular shape, just bulbous in nature, or may be highly irregular. And some interesting features may also develop. Say, I've got this from the that succession only, just uh, resembling a uh, left footprint of a human being. So this is the foot part and these are the fingers. However, this is from Proterozoic. Uh, then other deformation structures are also found within the turbidites. Uh, this is ball and pillow from Subatu succession of Sabimala. This is convolute bedding. It is very common in turbidite. Uh, then <coughs> fruit cast. This is very interesting. In this deep sea fan successions, in the proximal part, it is profusely developed. And it is a very, very important feature for identification of the proximal and distal part, or rather to distinguish the proximal part from the distal part of deep sea fan. Uh, very recently, uh, one paper has been published by Tikal and his co-workers in sedimentology this year only. They have worked uh, excellent work on this particular structure of uh, turbidate. In the distal part, we normally get uh, different types of tool marks. And another very interesting feature that is called fading climbing ripple. I think uh, students are familiar with this term climbing ripple lamination. They have uh, heard about uh, supercritical, subcritical, and critical varieties. But this is a special type only found in distal part of turbidate. This is fading climbing ripple, where this uh, laminations fade out. Okay, again, this is from uh, this uh, lesser Himalayan succession. Uh, it is fading uh, out like this, very faint, and it is associated with some combined flow features. Now, in the literature, you often come across a term high density turbidity current. When I uh, first found this term in a paper, <coughs> I tried to understand what is the basis of this definition, why they are calling it a high density turbidity current and uh, how can they differentiate it from low density turbidity current. But nowhere I got any definition or any criterion or uh, in support of this nomenclature. And what I found, it is absolutely arbitrary. And it became to me totally confusing where, uh, when I saw uh, in Lawe's paper in 1979 paper, where he described the uh, uh, rheologic property of uh, so-called sediment gravity flow. And he mentioned that the flow character of turbidity current varies from turbulent to laminar. It is not acceptable because turbidity current by definition is a turbulent flow. If it is a laminar flow, then it must be designated as a separate flow, not turbidity current. Turbidity current cannot be a laminar flow. It is absolutely contradictory. Now, uh, later I found some explanation. Uh, uh, first, uh, in the last paper of that series on uh, turbidity current, Milton in 19... Uh, 67 uh, paper, he mentioned that he observed some significant change in the flow character of turbidity current at grain concentration beyond 30%. Uh, 
Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get any uh, follow-up paper, so we don't know exactly what he observed uh, in his experiment. But I could correlate this with another experiment by Grimm, an eminent clay mineralogist, uh, in his book, uh, Applied Clay Mineralogy, published in 1968. Uh, here, uh, he explained uh, the nature of change in viscosity of clay water mixture. And where he demonstrated that there is a sharp rise in viscosity when the clay content exceeds 23%. So here we can relate this to. Now, uh, about 30 years later, uh, Shomugam in 1996, uh, from rheology point of view, he defined so-called high density turbidity current as non-cohesive debris flow. Yes, uh, this term uh, was definitely coined by him, but this idea is not new because in Allen's book, 1985, uh, there is a specific mention, but Allen stated that addition of outsized class in a monodisparse system may cause sharp fall in viscosity. Thus, the questionless sediments deposited from a plastic flow do not contain any larger class. So, uh, he had a very clear idea that uh, plastic flow of cohesionless material is also possible, and definitely he had very clear evidence with him. I don't know why he uh, did not elaborate at this point. Uh, uh, did not elaborate this point. However, uh, so what is debris flow? Now. Uh, this uh, point is very important because uh, this term has been widely misused by workers. Uh, even different types of deposits has been uh, described as debris, particularly those uh, from uh, hyper-concentrated flow. Uh, however, debris flow is a laminar flow of plastic material. This point is very important. Now, for undergraduate students, I uh, would like to elaborate one point. What is plastic character? Just imagine a, one a flat plate. Uh, you take, keep it horizontal. Take a droplet of uh, fresh water. Then you slowly tilt it. When you tilt the plate, that droplet will start flowing. If you keep on increasing the tilt, it will keep on accelerating. So that character is called Newtonian character of fluid. And instead of fresh water, if you take a sugar syrup, dense sugar syrup uh, on this plate, and if you tilt it, you will see that up to certain angle, it will not flow. When you make it steeper, then that fluid will start flowing. That is called plastic character. That means the material can withstand deformation up to a certain limit. And that is normally referred to as yield strength, beyond which it yields. And uh, students must uh, know that this flow, these are nothing but shear deformation of a fluid mass. Okay. And so there are two types of debris flow. One is cohesive debris flow where the cohesive force due to high surface free energy of clay provides the yield strength. Non-cohesive debris flow where the frictional resistance induces the plastic character. Now, uh, it may be a sub-aerial flow, it may be sub-aqueous flow. Now, uh, you may think that uh, when it is sub-aerial flow and very sluggish due to this high viscosity, it may be laminar in character. But when it is flowing in subaqueous conditions surrounded by water, and that is also on a frictional surface, then how can it continue as a plastic flow? Actually, the subaqueous debris flow proceeds by hydroplaning. And this was first identified by Morig and his co-workers in 1998, long back. Thereafter, uh, many people carried out experimental work and mathematical modeling on this debris flow phenomenon. And uh, again, uh, this is from uh, one 
paper on uh, experimental work by De Blasio and his co-workers. Uh, this is the flow head. And this is the uh, distribution of pressure, what uh, they measured. Now, there is a thin film of water between the substratum and the flowing mass. And that thin film of water acts as lubricant. And that's why it can proceed as a laminar flow. And this mechanism is called hydroplaning. Now, this is a famous photograph of Major's experiment. Actually, uh, he first, uh, from this experiment, uh, defined debris flow in a proper way, where uh, he described this as uh, in mass flow and uh, on reaching a gentler surface uh, to freeze in mass. But uh, exactly, it is not freezing uh, instantly. Uh, due to this inertia, it uh, smears slowly. Uh, and this smearing is very important because it has got a very high shear force, okay, shearing effect on the earlier deposits. Now, this is uh, one practical example of uh, subaerial debris flow. This is Varunavat Hill of Uttarkashi, and this Lansa slide took place uh, on uh, 23rd September 2003. I visited this place sometime in the January 2004, but uh, this was a restricted area. I could reach there uh, with the help of Indoni, one of my uh, students. He was uh, that time posted there in uh, this Terry Dam project. Now, uh, this is a fall of 600 meters. Okay. But uh, I saw, uh, when I saw this uh, site, uh, uh, this location is called uh, Ramlila Maidan, and this is called Masjid Mahalla. Uh, these two are two major flows. Now, here I saw that after reaching the base, after, say, 600 meter fall, after reaching the base, when this is a flat surface, the whole mass stopped flowing. And you, you can see these multi storied buildings here, and you can have some idea about the dimension of this flow. The whole township escaped a devastation just because of the fact that the flowing mass was plastic in nature, and there was a flat land in between the hill and the township. That is the beauty of debris flow. And deprive the end product of debris flow. Now, as I mentioned earlier, in case of non-cohesive debris flow, we get only a massive sand body. No outsized clust is found within non-cohesive debris flow. But in cohesive debris flow deposit, we get outsized clusts randomly oriented. No definite pattern is there, randomly distributed and randomly oriented also. And very interesting point is that in such cases, we often get upright class, say like this, or large class at a high angle, uh, making high angle with the depositional surface. Actually, these positions are very unstable positions in gravitational field. But what does it imply? It implies thixotropic character of the ground mass. As soon as it stopped, it behaved as a solid mass and the grains could not be reoriented as in the case of your oil well drilling mud. That is also a thixotropic character. Now, another interesting thing is that in uh, such massive uh, material, we often get some layers with glass, preferably oriented parallel to the deposition and surface. These planes actually imply the plane of amalgamation of successive debris flow. Uh, this is again from Uttarkashi. Here you see this layer, rich in class. Most of the class are parallel to the depositional surface. This is the plane of amalgamation 
this is one uh, debris flow, and this is of younger generation. Now this outside crust, this is very interesting. And uh, many people took outsized crust as a thumb rule for identification of debris. It is very strange. And people like Blair and McPherson, they often describe debris flow deposit from alluvial fan. But uh, for, uh, one point uh, I would like to mention here that debris flow is not expected in any perennial flowing system. In ephemeral system, it is possible, but in uh, perennial system, debris flow is not possible. But what I saw here, uh, that the ground mass is sandy in nature, but according to Allen, the non-cohesive debris flow cannot carry outsized class. So how can it be deposited in this way? Now, if we see any such fan deposit, actually the, the earlier photograph was from uh, upper uh, Shualik boulder conglomerate deposit of Pinjor. Now, here uh, you can see that uh, during uh, flood season, that means uh, monsoon, the coarsest traction, the gravel is deposited, but no fines are deposited. It is carried out. But uh, when the water level comes down, uh, the water started percolating uh, through this material and the finer fraction may be trapped here. And subsequently, this finer material percolates through the pore spaces as sieve deposit. So in such deposits, the coarser fraction and the finer fraction, these two are not the product of the same flow event. They are separately deposited. That point we must keep in mind. Now, point is that Still, how this upright class can be deposited? Now, when this water level is coming down, the water starts percolating through the existing bars, and when it comes out of the bar, it will remove the finer material. And due to removal of the finer material, the coarser uh, boulders collapse down randomly. Some of these boulders may stuck in this upright position within the mud, and due to this low energy condition, it is subsequently filled in by the fine material, and it will remain there as upright crust. The same feature we got in rock record also. This, uh, this is the path through which this crust came down and finally became upright crust. Now, <laughs> the most important thing in a uh, case of this mass flow is the flow transformation. Because in nature, the major type of deposits are of intermediate character, not exactly representing the end members. First is body transformation. Just to imagine some sediment is there. It is, uh, uh, it has become unstable due to, say, maybe over stepping or liquefaction, and it starts flowing as a debris flow. Now, during this flow, when it reaches some steep slope, it will be accelerated. And simultaneously, the Reynolds number will increase, and it will be converted into a turbidity current. Now, during this process, an intermediate phase develops. That is called hyper-concentrated flow. And it is uh, widely accepted. And these flows maybe have uh, two-phase or multi-phase character. Coarser class and fluid, these two components behave independently. Fluid component possesses meager yield strength compared to debris flow. And the role of turbulence may be important as a grain support mechanism. And subaerial hyper concentrated flows are often called mud flow. Now, this is again from Lesser Himalaya. Uh, this is hyper concentrated flow deposit. Apparently, it is massive in nature, uh, but uh, if you observe carefully, there is some evidences of flow differentiation. And within these uh, massive layers also, we often get this type of organization due to shearing effect. Uh, 
I, particularly in the trailing phase of this uh, flow. And our further uh, transformation, this type of bipartite layer or this type of uh, grading, these are also uh, found associated with hyperconcentrated flow deposits. Next uh, flow transformation is gravity transformation, and this is common, very common in turbidity current. As I mentioned earlier, that during this flow, the finer material is taken back to the upper part of the flowing mass, and uh, the lower part, uh, in the lower part, the uh, coarser material is concentrated. Now, by this way, when the flow character is distinctly divisible into two due to high concentration of the uh, grains in the lower part and dilute upper part, then that is called bipartite flow. And it can be generated by an excess of sediment supply towards the flow base relative to the deposition rate and may lead to deposition of bipartite beds. And another interesting feature we often get that this concentrated flow may further proceed and it is driven by the tractive force exerted by the overriding turbidity current. Then that is called traction current. Now, this is product of bipartite flow, bipartite bed. Uh, here, this uh, carbonate class are very tightly packed, uh, whereas in the upper part, uh, these are floating within the finer material. And this is another example of uh, bipartite layer. And again, this is photomicrograph. Okay, this is bipartite layer. So again, it is scale independent. And traction carpet, it was uh, very beautifully described by Sean in 1997. And he pointed out that uh, this uh, traction carpet, when it is well developed, can be broadly classified into two segments. The lower frictional region, which behaves as non-cohesive debris flow, and the upper collisional region, which behaves as a grain flow or subaqueous grain flow. So the uh, deposit is something like this. The uh, lower part is massive in nature, but the upper part is inversely graded. Uh, this is again from Jody Avicin, this photo. Next comes the entrant turbidity current. This is very important, particularly when uh, we talk about subaqueous debris flow. When the uh, debris flow is flowing, uh, this mass is flowing through the ambient fluid. Due to continuous friction, the finer material uh, goes into suspension, and this type of turbidity current is generated. This is called entrant turbidity current. And when uh, this uh, debris flow stops, uh, this, mat uh, this flow moves forward and deposition takes place beyond the snout of the uh, debrite. And this material may be subsequently deformed due to uh, shearing force by the younger uh, debris flow. And the examples, this is from Talchir Basin, Odisha, uh, the Gondwana succession, Talchir formation. This is one uh, this is another debrite, and this pocket is of entrant turbidite. If we enlarge it, it looks like this. This deformation is mainly due to shearing exerted by this debrite. Here also you see the upright class, dominance of upright class within the debris flow. So it was sixotropic in nature. And if we enlarge this part, this is the appearance. And a sample from this part, it looks like this. At every level in this scale or in this scale, you will get normal grading. Another example from Blaney diamectite of Lesser Himalaya. This is Blaney diamectite, and this is the entrant turbidite. <coughs> but uh, here, it's a, uh, this uh, character is not readily discernible because this is very fine grained material. But the thin section we found excellent uh, development of bipartite layer and normal grading. Okay, that is the beauty of flow dynamics. Okay, we get it in me uh, mesoscopic scale, even megascopic scale, as well as in microscopic scale. So 
uh, the uh, flow, natural flow of sediment uh, fluid mixture can be broadly classified in this way. Uh, this is the flow type. Uh, first, pure fluid flow, you just imagine the river and flow in the high altitude where it is absolutely clear. Then uh, with further increase in uh, Sediment, uh, low density sediment laden flow, the riverine flow, that is the uh, flow of Ganges in Calcutta. Then, uh, on further increase in uh, sediment, it may be mud flow or turbidity current. This is sub aqueous, this is sub aerial. And these are uh, all turbulent flow and uh, flow rheology is fluidal flow. On further increase in grain concentration, it becomes transitional flow, the hyper concentrated flow, and it is semi plastic in nature. And it uh, gets into uh, debris flow on further increase in proportion of sediment. Debris flow may be non cohesive debris flow, this is frictional flow. And cohesive debris flow, this is uh, again plastic, uh, these all are plastic flow. Cohesive debris flow is cohesive flow, this is frictional flow. And obviously, these are laminar flow. And finally, sub aqueous grain flow, it is collisional flow or granular flow. Now, the last type that is grain flow. Uh, actually, for, uh, following Stoffer and Milton and Hampton, Lawe defined grain flow as the gravity flow of non-cohesive solids maintained in a dispersed state against the force of gravity by an intergranular dispersive pressure arising from grain interactions within the shearing sediments. Now, it's absolutely confusing. Why? Uh, as I uh, already mentioned, that uh, in a multiphase flow, the sediment support mechanism is relevant. But when it's a single phase granular flow which is flowing under the action of gravity, there we are considering another mechanism which is acting against the driving force. It is not acceptable. This is contradictory. Uh, and it obviously needs some. Uh, probe uh, to understand the actual mechanism. Now, we geologists, we are more concerned about the end product. So the proper understanding of the flow mechanism involves explaining the depositional feature and grain flows have a distinctive feature due to particle segregation uh, leading to development of inverse grading. So we have to find out the explanation of inverse grading so that we can understand the grain flow mechanism properly. Now, they use the term dispersive pressure. It was an uh, original idea of Bagnall. It was uh, published in 1954, who argued that the large grains of a mixture under the influence of dispersive pressure gradient migrate towards the free surface of flow, where the strain is least, and the smaller grains correspondingly move towards the surface of the shear, and by this way, the reverse uh, grading results. Now, uh, when I first came uh, to know about this term, dispersive pressure, I uh, consulted all literature to get some idea about this term, its definition, or how does it work. But nowhere I uh, got anything about dispersive pressure, any explanation, excepting one uh, figure is there in, uh, Fried, uh, in the book by Friedman and Sanders, uh, possibly in the chapter seven. Uh, uh, but uh, it was uh, too confusing because when I saw the figure, uh, it is just, uh, he described the mechanism of saltation. So if that is the dispersive pressure mechanism, then uh, in the fluvial deposit, we are supposed to uh, get uh, profusely developed inverse grading, but that we don't get. Then what is the actual meaning of dispersive pressure? Now, I came across one uh, publication in 2001 by Straub, who uh, explicitly mentioned that unfortunately, the relations between his experimental results and the motion of natural granular flows have never been explicitly investigated. Instead, assumptions have been made on how Bagnall's results can be utilized to understand natural sediment flow behavior. And in any textbook, you'll find that uh, people are writing like this, uh, it is inverse grading due to dispersive pressure. But if you ask what is dispersive pressure, no answer. So, 
uh, ultimately uh, i uh, uh, consulted the original paper actually that time it was very difficult to get that paper it is not available in geological survey of india also i got this from iit bombay uh, sorry iit kharagpur now uh, before that i want to mention uh, one uh, paper here uh, that is paper by legros who first uh, raised this question can dispersive pressure cause inverse gradient in grain flow this paper is very important for me because this paper inspired me to carry out the experiment to understand the grain flow dynamics however before that uh, what i saw in that paper i'm sorry to say the whole paper is full of fallacies when he first described the dispersive pressure and the page 58 of his paper in equation 6 it was described the dispersive pressure as proportional to the lambda square where lambda is the linear con grain concentration now you just see if it is proportional to the grain concentration and as soon as dispersion takes place there would be a sharp fall in grain concentration and obviously this is according to this expression this mechanism is self destructive again this uh, velocity gradient was expressed by this now if we put this uh, uh, value in the earlier equation we'll get this expression and actually uh, this was derived by bagnold also now you see this is free from d that means the grain diameter so the dispersive pressure according to the relation derived by bagnold is independent of grain diameter and the inference drawn by bagnold in page 62 in his paper on mechanism of sorting of grains in a grain flow does not hold true because this goes against that interpretation now when i probed into the experimental setup i was really confused because he carried out this experiment in a rotary drum uh, this is the reference you can consult this uh, paper if you are interested and uh, when i uh, went through the description there i saw that this con grain concentration along the peripheral part it was simply due to centrifugal force why he described this as dispersive pressure etc etc i don't understand and uh, i'm sorry to say it is one of the highest cited publication in uh, our science so obviously i tried to uh, get explanation for inverse gradient then i came across another paper by middleton 1970 where he described a mechanism called kinetic saving it is same as what i uh, discussed earlier at sieb deposit where the uh, finer particles are going down through the pore space uh, between the larger grains but uh, it should be two way traffic for the development of inverse gradient the finer grains are coming down but what is the mechanism to uh, lift the uh, coarser grains that is not explained there uh, that's why i uh, designed one experiment this was my flume it was in presidency college and uh, in this flume this is the source chamber this is log gate made up of rubber and it is adjustable and this is clinometer uh, inclinometer to measure the angle of slope when we made this slope very steep greater than 35 degree then the whole material as soon as we opened the uh, uh, gate the whole material came down uh, here and uh, wedge shaped hip uh, hip developed and uh, it was absolutely massive in nature but when we made it gentler uh, around 28 degree uh, or 27 degree as soon as i opened this it just settled making the surface to angle of repose again it was massive in nature but when 
I made this angle 31 degree or 30 degree or 30.5 degree. That is very close to the angle of repose for this population. The whole material slowly went down the slope. And I observed a very interesting process active in that flow. In response to the shear force, why shear? One force is active, the gravitational pull down the slope. The other is the frictional resistance. And in response to this couple, each and every particle started rolling. And when the coarser particle came adjacent to the finer particle, just it climbed up. And the critical value of uh, flow shear stress we calculated was this. So it is a very simple process of climbing. Now, uh, by this way, it is going up and the finer materials are coming down. By this way, uh, the inverse grading developed. It's a very simple process, no dispersive pressure, nothing. And uh, this was our result. And the interesting thing is that when the grains of same size came adjacent to each other, immediately the flow stopped, instant. And by this process, uh, or from this uh, experiment, we redefined grain flow as a single phase shear flow of dry granular material along the critical slope of angle of repose. The resultant deposit is inversely graded, tabular, and inclined bit. So today's highlights, the term sediment gravity flow is misnomer. Turbidity currents can generate and sustain only under homopicnal condition. The idea of high density turbidity current does not stand valid. The concept of hyperpicnal turbidity current is fallacious. Upright clust, it is very important, may be found in deposits other than those from cohesive debris flows. The matrix composition is important for proper interpretation. Flow transformation is a common phenomenon. Deposits of intermediate phases are common in nature, and the idea of grain supporting mechanism in monodispersed grain flow is irrelevant. Thank you for your patient sharing. Some problem is there, I think. You are not uh, audible. They were the one mic take a thick coro. On a different note, I would like to remind everybody that next week we shall be having two lecture sessions. On 28th September, we are going to have with us Professor Michael Benton, Professor of Vertebrate Paleontology, School of Earth Sciences, University of Bristol, United Kingdom, at 3.30 p.m. IST. 
and he will enlighten us on recovery of life from the greatest mass extinction of all time and on 29 september at 8:30 pm ist we shall be having professor nigel views of university of california riverside and he will be delivering a lecture on the topic ups and downs in himalayas using the ancient sedimentary record to constrain himalayan uplift and erosion we are really overwhelmed by all your response to our endeavors so far and would be even happier with your presence in our upcoming lecture sessions please uh, wait just for a few more moments and then we will start our question answer session okay uh, now that we have received the questions we are going to start the question answer session owing to the vast multitude of questions we have received we won't be able to accommodate all for that we surely apologize however we shall try to take as many possible to the speaker within the stipulated time so am i audible yeah okay sir so the first question we have from irfan raza institute of geology university of the punjab lahore and his question is explain the role of following in mass movement sensitive soils hydro compacting compacting clays and quick clays uh would you please repeat these three terms again yes sir so the three terms are sensitive soils yeah. hydro compacting clays and quick and, clays uh, okay <coughs> uh actually uh, in case of clay uh, the movement what we experience that is called creeping that is a very slow movement and that is mainly due to expansion and contraction of clay uh, due to uh, periodic drying and wetting and when uh, this uh, clay minerals are uh, moistened they have soils and by that way when they are over stepped slowly move down the slope uh, by the process of creeping and quick sand this is a very specific case of liquefaction okay uh, and uh, it is not exactly purely clay it contains sufficient amount of sand also and Uh, that is uh, liquidized and then it may uh, flow and uh, this creeping process you can consider uh, the initial phase of uh, cohesive debris flow thank you sir for the explanation for the next question we have mr shubhashish pal and he is a pg student ism dhanbad and his question is is there any key role of slope of the continental margin relating to the experiment of hyperpisonal flow as the slope is not so high as in real condition in case of ocean now uh, uh, what type of flow he is asking for hyperpisonal flow yes sir no uh, what uh, i uh, mentioned specifically that this uh, term uh, we always use hyperpisonal to explain the uh, relative density of the fluid uh, okay our slope uh, that is very important here because uh, that slope defines uh, even after initial instability the slope that defines uh, uh, the nature of flow as i mentioned earlier that uh, say even if it is a uh, initial debris flow due uh, on reaching a steeper slope it may be accelerated and uh, it may be converted into turbidity current and uh, in oceanic uh, marine system uh, this shelf 
slope break. This is a very important location for generation of this type of uh, flows because most of the deep sea fans, they, those materials are derived from the uh, deeper shelf on over steepening or uh, due to some uh, liquidization. This material comes down the uh, uh, slope and uh, reaches the deeper part of the basin, gets deposited there as fan. Thank you, sir. For the next question, we have Mr. Orunaditya Dash, PG student, IIT Roorkee. And his question is, is there any relation between the iron content and the thixotropic nature? How would the sediment iron content in various flows influence the thixotropic nature of the flow? Actually, a thixotropic uh, character uh, that is uh, that depends on the composition of the clay. Okay, uh, for example, uh, this uh, calcium atacolgite, uh, then uh, sodic uh, montmorillonite. Uh, these are uh, very common thixotropic minerals. Okay, and uh, the commonest one is used in our uh, drilling mud also. Uh, uh, and obviously that depends on the composition of the clay. All the clays are not, actually uh, general structure may be montmorillonitic, but uh, presence of certain ions uh, that actually control the uh, thixotropic character of the clay. Thank you, sir. For the next, for the next question, we have Mr. Shohum Banerjee, and he is a pass out from Presidency University. His question is: Can bipartite flow patterns be found within debris? No. Debris flow <coughs> is a uh, uh, where the whole material moves in mass and freezes in mass. So within a debris flow, there is no scope of any inflow differentiation. So whenever you get any bipartite layer, it implies it was deposited from a turbidity current, not a debris flow. Uh, OK, so he has another question. His question is, in a turbide debrite succession, Will changes in depositional conditions and tectonic settings lead to overall changes in the rheology and distinction between the two? Uh, actually, uh, if you get uh, any uh, continuum between uh, debrite and turbidite, uh, it is uh, expected to be a lateral uh, gradation. Okay, if uh, say. So, uh, just uh, theoretically, if we consider that uh, there is a vertical gradation of uh, debrite and turbidite, so obviously it implies uh, some major variation in depositional setting. Okay, uh, that may be uh, your uh, due to tectonic reasons. Say, for example, uh, slope is not uh, very steep, so uh, due to over steepening material. Uh, a flow just as a, a debris flow, but uh, due to some major seismic shock, uh, the uh, pre-existing sediment became uh, or, uh, fluidized and uh, it was initiated as a turbidity current. But in these cases, uh, we would get some signature within the earlier deposit so that we can relate them with this major change in tectonic history of the basin. Thank you, sir. For the next question, we have Mr. Pranok Shaha Chaudhuri, UG student, Presidency University. And he is asking that, as you have said, that the explanation of dispersal pressure is almost irrelevant and untrue, and only rolling is the cause of that, 
then do we find inverse grading in case of grain flow only no 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 i have specifically mentioned that in turbidite also we get inverse grading that is coastal inverse grading that is a different mechanism but in grain flow we definitely get uh, inverse grading that is distribution type and it is scale independent if you uh, see any uh, say aeolian ripple succession within the uh, ripple the ripple laminations within the ripple laminations you will uh, see in a distinct uh, inverse grading that is a very a characteristic feature for identification of aeolian uh, ripple it is unique property of uh, grain flow thank you sir uh, now without taking much more time we have some people raising their hands over ms teams so i would like to request them to please open their mic and ask the question directly to our speaker uh, 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 yes uh, i was saying uh, open the exam yes হ্যাঁ হ্যাঁ শোনা যাচ্ছে বলো আমি শুধু জিজ্ঞেস করছি যে পার্টিকুলারলি জনক ভট্টাচার্য এবং মালদার এবং সেসিকি ওরা ডিসটাল ডেল্টা থেকে মানে ডেল্টা এই ডেল্টা রিজিয়ন থেকে দে হ্যাভ রিপোর্টেড সাবমি থিনলি লেয়ার্ড ম্যাটেরিয়াল উইদিন মার্ক व्हिच বেসিক্যালি কনস্টিটিউটস অফ স্যান্ড এন্ড শো এ ডিসটিনক্ট পোরশন and which they call as hyperbaric pipe uh, ah, yeah, yeah. i know what do you think is the mechanism of it but like if you say that uh, hyperbaric pipe doesn't form uh, no, 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 no. uh, uh, say yeah uh, actually uh, what is the problem i'm telling uh, they uh, mentioned some uh, fraud events uh, due to some collapse of barrier right. etc yeah Uh, so uh, that was a uh, highly charged with sediment right and uh, definitely had very high momentum so right. it entered into the sea water up to certain distance definitely right. now thereafter when the mo- whole material went into suspension right okay d- due to lofting then suspension fall out over a vast area producing a thin layer right that is possible Oh, oh, uh, there is no problem with that deposit but uh, the problem is when they are uh, saying that uh, only hyperpicnal turbidity current can produce uh, your inverse grading in the succession and by this way you can distinguish it from the conventional turbidity and those parts are objectionable and uh, in that uh, discussion i am sorry to say uh, both uh, mulder and uh, your uh, shomugam none of them mentioned about hands contribution to explain this inverse grading both of them were discussing uh, uh, for uh, quite no. a few pages on this issue however uh, yes this, my, uh, my question is specifically why this inverse grading in a say in a suspension of setting and suspension setting is it a reverse no, no, charge no, uh, no, no, uh, no no actually that is not purely suspension follow up okay definitely the material was subsequently reworked after the initial deposit uh, the material was definitely subsequently reworked otherwise from any suspension fallout you cannot expect uh, right. any short of grading it is not possible right. actually they missed uh, some intermediate phase of this whole process okay okay, okay. after the initial deposition on the shelf the material might have been reworked because uh, Uh, due to rapid deposition possibly it was overstepped and reworked and finally proceeded like uh, our uh, turbidity current and got so, deposited it was a totally unconfined flow that's why it produced a thin sheet over a vast right, area right so uh, you would rather prefer a uh, resedimented turbidite the final grains that was deposited in the distal part of the delta rather than rather than what they try to uh, theorize as uh, hyperbaric from the charged uh, water flow entering the basin so they yeah, might have uh, but in proximity but then subsequently probably they were reworked and moved as a yeah, turbidite yeah, right? definitely definitely thank you thank you that was what i was asking 
thank you sir uh, now i would like to request s dashgupta who wanted to ask you a question through ms teams so can you please turn on your mic yeah uh, hi this is uh, sudipta dashgupta from uh, iit bombay uh, i would like to ask a related question about uh, the hyperpic nights of uh, kerry malder and sevitsky that some of them has the reactivation surface uh, of those thin laminae which has uh, coarsening up and uh, then fining up trend uh, yeah. whereas some, uh, the others do not have so without reactivation surface is it possible to say that this waxing and waning type of thin laminae uh, has any kind of reactivation yeah uh, see with this type of process is very common because uh, we got a uh, uh, thick succession in uh, lesser himala actually uh, what happens uh, this uh, uh, particularly the uh, bottom currents this bottom current processes uh, they often uh, uh, erode and redeposit the material and by that way this type of uh, Uh, internal erosional surfaces develop, and across that surface, you will get uh, say uh, deposits. Uh, uh, just uh, the uh, micro turbidite I have shown in uh, the picture that uh, was deposited in that way. The uh, by the bottom current, the material was uh, uh, reworked and uh, uh, eroded uh, on the uh, this erosional surface. Uh, uh, this uh, normally graded deposit. Uh, Uh, got deposited. Okay, so uh, this is uh, possible because uh, this. Uh, uh, what I think uh, your hyperpic night. This concept is highly uh, theoretical, and without any uh, experimental backup also, because uh, what they are uh, describing does not match with any experimental work. Uh, so uh, i think uh, they are missing something uh, because this type of uh, uh, extraneous uh, riverine flow uh, often enters into a sea uh, particularly in flood season it may be highly charged with sediments uh, but uh, how far can it uh, reach definitely it cannot reach i mean the basic point uh, shomugam raised okay it is not possible Yeah, my second question is, uh, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, my second question is about the swatch of no ground. Uh, it starts from almost like 22 degrees north and goes all the way crossing the equator and uh, further south. What can be the driving mechanism for uh, getting such a huge canyon uh, crossing almost like a, a continent, continent-sized distance? So, uh, what can be the driving mechanism? If we do a uh, kind of uh, a gradient profile, it shows very uh, gentle gradient. Yeah. Uh, would you please uh, repeat your question? I'm asking Details. about the swatch, swatch of no ground mm. that starts yeah. from the uh, Sundarban Delta. Yeah. And. Uh, That is around like 22 degrees north, and crosses yeah. the equator and goes further south. And if we see the gradient profile, it's very gentle. So, what mm. can be the driving mechanism to create such a gigantic canyon in the Bay of Bengal? Uh, 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 driving mechanism for the sediments. For creating such a large canyon. Oh. His question is about the formation of the canyon. Oh, I see. No, I am not very sure. I have to check it. Uh, if you are concerned about the formation of the canyon, I am not very sure. Tapanda, do you have any explanation for this? One one thing that appears to me, I am not very sure, but one thing that appears to me. the the uh, upstream end of the northern end of the canyon coincides with the shelf break and it is yeah. not very unlikely that when the sea level fell this canyon was carved on the shelf break by the rivers flowing there 
I mean, when the entire shelf was exposed, uh, this the shelf break was the point where the river was reaching and maybe excavating a canyon, which is now flooded and under the sea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that means it is a, a originally a Palio channel. Right, right. Uh, yeah. Might have been, might have been uh, uh, more uh, uh, enlarged and sustained by the gravity flow that uh, took place later. Yeah, <clears throat> I have some comments on this. You know, <clears throat> actually, this is uh, what Apunda said is um, very important. That because during the low stand systems, the rivers could go into the shelf break and can carve out the canyons. And then the canyon may enlarge in a cannibalistic way, because right. there are, uh, there are quite a number of uh, tectonic and uh, also self cannibalistic right. system yeah. to generate. And especially if you if you see the Amazon fan also in in the, uh, the that in the Brazilian coast, where also you have these canyons that form during the low stand systems, especially during the Pleistocene, uh, you know, the cold uh, glaciation time. I think there is a similar canyon in the Arabian Sea also. In fact, most of this uh, major river mouth has such this kind of canyons and that carved out during the Pleistocene uh, sea level fall. Yeah. Thank you so much. A nice talk. Yeah. Now I would like to request uh, Dr. Shukriyo Dash. He also want to ask some questions. Sir, can you please on your mic? Sir, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, uh, in Big Bowl Pan, we often find uh, thick hemipelagic deposits in between the tributaries. So I yeah. think this is uh, very uh, particular for the Bengal sedimentation. So in the field, how uh, could I identify the hemiplegic uh, intervals in between the tributaries? I mean, I am not very uh, familiar with the, with the hemiplegic intervals in the field. So I'm uh, uh, yeah. uh, actually, uh, this uh, material is normally silty mud. <laughs> you can say <laughs> silt. And uh, they are laterally extensive, uh, follow the substrate, uh, and uh, evenly uh, layered. Uh, and uh, uh, in some cases, of course, we get uh, some internal erosional surfaces uh, that is uh, due to some uh, uh, incision by some subsequent flows. Okay, but. Uh, these are very thinly layered, uh, laterally extensive deposits and mainly uh, argillaceous silt. Okay, thank you, sir. Because uh, uh, it is deposited from large uh, bivalent plume. Okay, hemipelagic material means uh, either nephloid layer or uh, large bivalent plume. This deposition takes place uh, uh, simply uh, through uh, suspension fallout. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for all the questions and answers. So due to time constraint, we now have to wrap up the session. So we have almost come to the end of today's session of Geochron 2020. I would now like to call Devaroti Shaha, Secretary of Geological Institute, for the vote of thanks. Over to you, Devaroti. Thank you, Rikarupa. As we have today's lecture session. On behalf of the Geological Institute, Presidency University, I take this opportunity to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our speaker, Dr. Dash Gupta, for taking out time from his busy schedule. We are really enlightened with your wisdom and knowledge. We hope to have you with us in the future for any such lecture or workshop. We are thankful to yeah. our honorable president of Geological Institute and HOD of Department of Geology, Professor Gautam Ghosh, for his help and motivation. I would also like to thank our Professor Zoyadip Mukhopadhyay for his enthusiastic support. A special thanks to all the other organizing committee members for their influencing support and coordination. 
our heartfelt thanks to all of our fellow college mates and participants for their active participation. Now we will take a screenshot just to preserve this wonderful memory. Thank you, sir. It's done. Thank you. Thank you, Pavitra, for joining us today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pavitra. For this opportunity. Thank, Thank you, you so much, sir. Thank you all. Yeah. And thank you for a very lively lecture. Two minutes, please. Yes. Pavitra, what a coffee do you take, lo? Next time okay. when you visit, we will have a coffee house. Pavitra. This is, uh, this is uh, yeah, a long yeah. time I heard a lecture on sedimentology after Professor Chandu. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the flair is very similar. Thank you. Do you want to copy it? Do you want to copy it? Do you want to copy it? <laughs> yeah, so with that coffee house deal. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to tell you about the song and it's to eat the coffee house. Good. I think it's a good thing. I'm going to borrow group way of social distancing. Yeah, that's it. Go to go. Chinta go. ঋষি আছো নাকি তুমি এখানে এখন হ্যাঁ 